uh, to present House File 2655. And again, I'm gonna ask Representative Pryor if you could move House File 2655 for referral to the Committee on Education Finance. Oh, great. Uh, yes, that is my motion, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Pryor. So, um, uh, Chair Bernardi, uh, welcome. So glad to have you. Uh, I think you got a couple of testifiers as well. So please um, uh, present your bill. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. It is an honor to be here and um, being in front of all these people who care so much, who, who care so deeply about the success of our students in the state. And it starts with our youngest learners, as you all know. Our best investments are with uh, our 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 long-term gains are made in investing early in our in our young scholars, as they call them, in in the communities in which I um, represent. We um, really focus on uh, pre uh, preschool students. And with us today, we are going to have um, Dr. Um, ha uh, Heal with us from Freely Public Schools and Carl Brown from Moundsview Schools. And what I've learned working with my school districts is it's this is not. Um, an extra kind of bill. This is essential. Investing in our youngest learners, the word I learned of the day is essential. And so um, I would like to um, ask the committee to make this permanent. This is one of the best investments we can make in our state. We've been coming back for the last two bienniums to make these seats um, uh, continue. And now it's time to make them permanent. And I uh, appreciate my testifiers coming today. And I know they will articulate the amazing things they are doing in our schools and the importance of this legislation. So with that, I will, um, uh, 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 excuse me, Chair Pinto, I'll let you call on my testifiers. And, and, uh, and Chair Bernardi, my one question is whether your test files will get into this or whether um, you want to, or whether I should have been, it's just to sort of explain a little more about what the, okay. um, kind of the context of the, what the bill does. Um, okay. We can do that however, sure. whatever Okay, well, yeah. yes. Okay, Mr. Chair, I, I, I will, well, I can follow up at the end, but I'll just say briefly, it's 4,000 voluntary preschool spots that are not uh, grandfathered in under the first uh, set of ones that went through, which were 3,160. And I'm getting kind of down into the weeds here now, but um, these, these, these um, have to be renewed every two years because that's the trend that's been happening. And um, I don't know, Mr. Uh, Chair, Pin, uh, Chair Pinto, what else would you like me to say about it? No, that's that's helpful. Just want to make sure. I think just for the context for members of the, members of the committee and of the public that there are these four thousand um, preschool slots that uh, keep uh, being scheduled to expire every two years, and uh, that causes a lot of disruption and concern. And, and my understanding of your bill is to say, um, let's stop that and let's make sure that four thousand kids can keep on um, receiving preschool uh, in our in our schools. Is that correct? Yes, and Mr. Chair, if I could add one more thing. Please. Well, and it's like waiting till, you know how the legislature works, waiting till the nth hour to find out if these opportunities are gonna be there for our students is very challenging to families and to our school districts. And uh, let's just get it done and so that they can plan accordingly and be able to have the most robust and um, easy to um, apply program than waiting till finding out at the nth hour if it's going to be funded or not. Terrific. Well, th well thank you, um, uh, Chair Bernardi. So I think your first test fight, it sounds like, is Dr. Heil, perhaps. Um, and so uh, if that's correct, well, Dr. Heil, um, identify yourself and then uh, please pr present your testimony. Well, we need to get you unmuted. Yes, hi. Good morning. Thank you, Chairperson oh, Pinto. And good morning, everyone. Whoop. Oh, you okay? Okay. Thank you, Chairperson Pinto. And good morning, everyone. I'm Vice Chair Pryor, as well as Reference Schools. Um, on behalf of our young scholars and families here in Fridley, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. I'd love to be a recipient of the VPDK funding since 2017, with an original allotment of seats. We also received slots in 2018-19 for a total of 114 seats. And in 1920, we received a total of our seats for the 2021-22 school year. These VP paid seats have provided as for many children to attend a preschool that otherwise would not have had that opportunity. 
Dr. Heil, we're over the past Heil, five years, forty-seven percent of our family that qualify for free. Yes. Just, um, yes. You're, we're having you. You're you're cutting out quite um quite often, and then and then really speeding up. We're having having some trouble with your connection. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Chair, would you mind? Fine, or uh, Representative Bernardi, I'm going to urge why I switch over. Yeah, maybe maybe if we can try to have you connect, maybe even by phone, perhaps, uh, or, or maybe just try turning off your, your video first. See if we can, can we hear you now? Hmm. Mr. Chair, can we yeah, just- Yeah, are you able to hear me, Chair Pinto? Yeah, as we're still having the same kind of kind of troubles. Um, uh, Chair Bernardi had a, had a suggestion. I'm just wondering if during um, doctor's testimony, if we can um, just all turn off our video while we listen to her oh. so that we can, maybe that'll help, I'm not sure. We can give that, uh, well, I don't know if it would help from our end to turn okay. our, turn our yeah. Um, but um, Dr. Heil, I wonder if maybe what we do is have um, the, uh, is have um, Mr. Brown uh, uh, go and then we'll maybe have you log off and back on and then give that a try if that's okay. And maybe even have you come in, you could come in through the phone number, perhaps. That sounds uh, perfect. Thank yeah. you, Chair. I'll switch computers. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Heil. Yeah, we'll, we'll see you soon. Um, so um, I think we have Mr. Brown up next. And so if you could please identify yourself and, uh, and then proceed with your testimony. Great. Uh, thank you, Chair Pinto. My name is Carl Brown. I'm the Director of Community Education for Mountains View Public Schools. And I'm here today to, uh, I guess, testify in support of uh, School Readiness Plus funds. In our district, we've been recipients of these funds through the application process. Uh, we have 100 seats um, that help our, um, I would say, uh, you know, most of our um, underserved and, and kids that normally wouldn't have preschool opportunities. So they, it, we've been very grateful and thankful for having these seats available. Uh, they've been serving families that really um, often don't know about the programs that are available and have financial barriers and uh, sometimes other barriers that may prevent them from accessing high quality programs. And then when I talk about high quality programs, it's also something I very much support the idea of having licensed staff and certified staff. So we make sure we put uh, high quality and capable uh, staff members in front of uh, our kids that need it the most. Permanent funding also allows registration and recruitment of students um, like uh, Representative Bernardi had shared um, during the time when we normally would do that. So typically in a preschool uh, setting, January and February, right this time of the year is when registration would open, found Families want to lock in what uh, school would look like because right now preschool is optional for families. It's really something where they're making these decisions early rather than having to wait. Unlike K-12, where they would just assume if you're a first grader, you'll move on to second grade the next year. And it's really not a whole lot of a process. The assumption is you're going to come. So having those uh, opportunities available allows registration to open. It allows us to um, really um, be equitable in the process. Of, of making sure that we're providing early, early learning opportunities for all of our students and making the same resources available at the same timelines. And really a lot of that involves uh, the placement of classes, how many students would be in classes, and then uh, having uh, the appropriate numbers of staffing, which is teachers and paras in many cases, plus special education services as needed. And so having that same timeline really puts us into the typical budget cycle that we would have uh, during the school year when we are uh, going through the rest of our staffing processes. And for school districts, we try to lock that up uh, you know, towards the end of the school year. And so a challenge has been if it's under legislative uh, funding timelines, we may not know until the end of the session or in some cases, uh, even into the summer, which um, creates a challenge. And really uh, the challenges for districts is we either have to kind of hedge a bet that we are going to receive the funding and we place accordingly and if it comes in, great. And then we have students that we've identified uh, and, and placed into classes. And if we wait, it really is something where we would have to wait until the time would be uh, knowing that. And then uh, there's not a lot of time in the summer to identify families and do that. And one of the last things we'd wanna do is uh, recruit families and share with them the values and benefits of preschool and to turn around and have to tell them we're not able to serve them because we don't have funding for them. So having that locked in funding would allow us to have conversations and really have the outreach that would be necessary for that. And from an equity perspective, which we have been working a lot in our district, it's something that we want to have these uh, opportunities available and know that not all students have the same opportunities. The scholarship programs have really been um, a great tool and a great uh, um, piece to be able to provide those opportunities and help people understand them. And having permanent funding would allow us to continue those outreach 
uh, efforts on an ongoing annual basis so that we start recruiting students and their siblings that may be coming to us you know, the next year or the year after and really working with families in a more uh, coordinated way. Um, with that, having that, uh, the budgeting piece too, is just something that it really reduces some of the risk. Um, it's something that if we would serve families without the funding, um, our early childhood programs would have to come up with the funds, which we just don't have the budget to do. And so really having that as a as an opportunity to make sure we can serve all of the families we have. There are other uh, you know, benefits we have, but those are kind of a summary in the time we have available. Um, very supportive of the funds and it's been uh, extremely helpful for the 100 seats we've had in our district. So thank you for the committee and, and the support of the legislature to provide this for our students. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, right at the beginning of your testimony, you used a phrase that I just wanna make sure that, that folks, especially members of the public um, understand, you said school readiness plus and that, that's the name for these 4,000 preschool uh, seats um, that are expiring and the, the bill proposes to make permanent. Um, so just wanna make sure, yeah, no, that's, that's good. I don't think we've used that phrase before. I wanna make sure folks understand it. Um, so good, so thank you so much. Um, I see we have Dr. Heil back on, so we'll give another try. I, I, I suspect the storm is not helping um, connections here. So, um, so Dr. Heil, we'll bring you back up and, uh, and then please, um, we might have, want to have you just start from the beginning with your testimony because we're sort of cutting out and please um, proceed. Thank you so much, Chair Pinto, and thank you, Carl, for uh, covering me while I switch computers. So good morning, everyone. On behalf of our young scholars here and families in Fridley, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to each and every one of you this morning. Fridley has really been fortunate to be a recipient of VPK funding since 2017 which when where we received allotment of about 68 seats. Since then, we've also received additional slots in 1819 of 114 seats and in 1920 of 145 seats. We again were allocated 145 seats this uh, current school year. Our VP uh, seats have provided, as Representative Bernardi was saying, essential and needed opportunities for many of our scholars to attend preschool who would have not had the opportunity to do so. Uh, over the past five years, 47% of our families have qualified for free and reduced lunch. And for 2021-22, 57% of our families have qualified. Also in 21-22, of those families that attend, 35% of our families have a home language other than English. Additionally, in 2021-22, we're currently serving 40% Black African American, 31% White American, 5% multiple races were identified, 13% Asian, 10% Hispanic, 1% American Indian. And fairly our preschool and our number one focus is to ensure that our young scholars are prepared for success in kindergarten. That's our goal. Fairly uh, Public Schools is an international baccalaureate program. And we are the only E through 12 IB continuum in the state of Minnesota. Our program is inquiry and play-based. So Fridley has had several parent aware rated early childhood, uh, childhood program recognitions. As a school program, we are very intentional in reaching out to our families for VPK. All of our families are able to register. However, we do prioritize giving it to students based on need. So at Fridley Public Schools, we're very good at blending our funds. So in order to maximize the amount of preschool, preschool kids that we can serve. So for example, we use school readiness, we use um, special services and VPK funds for a total of 160 total four-year-old preschool seats available this year. Our current enrollment is 135 students uh, due to reduced enrollment due to COVID pandemic, but this is an increase from 117 from last year. For our three-year-old scholars who use school readiness program, 34% of our kids receive a pathway scholarship. 72% of our students pay either no fee or qualify for a reduced rate on a sliding fee. 25% are African-American, 69% are white, 3% Asian, 3% Hispanic Latinx. So if when one of our funding streams is removed or reduced, the program has to adjust and this will reduce our ability to serve our families. So this would be a significant reduction in Fridley's four-year-old preschool program. And this will put the burden of the cost on a parent's shoulders, many of which you cannot afford to uh, do so. So it's very important to us, and I thank you for listening today to continue success of our VPK program 
to remain strong by having us funding fully intact at its current funding level. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heil, and uh, I think we could we could see and hear that very well all the way through. So good stuff with the connection. Uh, thank you, uh, and thanks for your work. Um, and I should have thanked uh, uh, Mr. Brown as well for his work for, uh, with our with our, our young kids and our young people. Um, and I think we do have a third testifier for you, um, Chair Bernardi, uh, Jody Wambakin. I hope I'm saying your last name correctly, but please identify yourself and, and proceed. Thank you, Chairperson Pinto, Jody Wambeck, Wilmer Public Schools Early Childhood Programs Manager. On behalf of young children and families around the state, thank you for the work you and the committee are doing around early education. I'm testifying today to support the bill to make VPK and SRP seats permanent. And thank you, Representative Bernardi, for her advocacy work on this bill. Wilmer has been fortunate enough to be a recipient of VPK funds since 2017 with the allotment this year of 120 seats. Over the last two years, we have seen an, a significant uptick in the needs of our children. With the increase of needs, it is more important than ever to have year-to-year -year consistent preschool funding and programming that is hands-on and developmentally appropriate. This type of programming lends itself to children building the strong foundations they need for learning. Ensuring that our program reaches the children that would benefit most from preschool, we rely heavily on our cultural liaisons as our first connection to many of our families, especially shift work parents or families who utilize family friend neighbor care or legally non-licensed care. Our liaisons have worked hard to bridge the gaps in our Somali and Latino communities to build those relationships that continue from preschool throughout a child's school career. Of the 150 pre-K children we're currently serving, we have 62% of our kiddos receiving free and reduced lunch and 65% are a race other than white, not of Hispanic origin. And as the school-based early learning program in Wilmer, we work closely with providers in our community to support children and families to ensure our children are prepared to be successful learners. Wilmer has several parent aware rated early childhood programs from private preschool to childcare centers or family childcare. And what that means for us as a school based program is that we're very intentional in our outreach to families who enroll in VPK. All families can register, however, we do prioritize based on need. And we work very closely with our ECFE program to provide parent support through ECFE classes outreach or our parent partner program that aligns a parent educator with families who need additional support. Like Fridley, we also blend and braid our funding streams in Wilmer to offer the programming that we do. And if one of the streams is removed, we have to readjust and put the burden of the cost onto the parents, which would most would be unable to afford the cost of tuition, which would then unintentionally widen the achievement gap. And having that consistent funding helps ensure families are able to access programming that is hands-on and developmentally appropriate that will support children in being a successful learner. Thank you, Chairperson Pinto. Thank you so much, um, uh, Ms. Wambeck, and, and for your work um, with young kids uh, in your community and our state as well. Um, and so we have, so um, Chair Bernardi, I think we're gonna move to public testifiers, the public testifiers now, unless, uh, anything to add at this point. I'll have to give you a both last word when we're all done anyway. So I guess we'll move to that. So um, I believe have, we have uh, Ms. Pringle, I believe. Um, so if you can please uh, identify yourself and proceed. There we go. Good morning, Chair, um, committee members. My name is Coolia Pringle and I am with the National Parents Union and I work with families across the state one-on-one -on -one as they navigate the education system. And I'm here um, to um, to voice their support for the bill. Um, this um, having high quality early childhood programming um, is a very, as the representative said earlier, essential, critical, and needed in the family, with the families that I work with on a daily basis. And having, um, having these programs, as we all know, um, increases the likelihood of many children having um, a very good pathway towards a K-12 program. Uh, many Black and Latino children miss the opportunity to have access to high quality um, state-funded preschools. Um, and a lot of times it's due to systemic racism that causes the gaps that for Black and Latino children experience, which makes it, again, essential and of high importance for families to have access to opportunities and pathways to success for K-12. Um, making funding permanent um, again, is essential, crucial, critical, and needed 
And if, if um, funds are permanently made, um, we are actually showing our families that our children do matter. Thank you. Ms. Pringle, thank you very much um, for your testimony. So um, I think uh, members, we're gonna move to uh, questions and discussion at this point, unless I'm just making sure, that I know there's one other person that signed up, but I think is not on right now. So I'll have staff let me know if, if that person is able to join. Um, but uh, members, we will be voting because, and I should probably explain that although this area of uh, uh, preschool is within our committee's jurisdiction, the funding for this proposal, if it were to advance, um, would be in the general education formula, which is uh, in the, under the jurisdiction of Chair Dabney's uh, committee. And so the plan is to pass that on his committee. And speaking of which, uh, Chair Dabney has his hand raised, and so I'll uh, call on him. Thank you, Chair Pinto. And I uh, mostly just want to thank Chair Bernardi for bringing forward this bill. Uh, the testifiers have done an excellent job of establishing the need uh, for families and the need for, for districts. If, if members uh, and the public listened, making these 4,000 seats permanent is simply good stewardship of our responsibility as a legislature. Districts, you know, Mr. Brown was very uh, clear on this, need to be able to plan. Staff members need to be able to plan. Families need to be able to plan. And when you think of who these families are, these are our youngest learners. Uh, that also usually ties to the most anxious parents <laughs> about what my, what is my kid going to be doing in the fall? Are they going to be safe? Are they going to be learning? Are they going to be in a rich environment? And that's what the schools promise. And that's what the legislature has consistently failed to follow through on our responsibility and our promise. Uh, as the House, we took making these uh, 4,000 seats permanent into conference committee last year. And then when we were forced into special session, into the working group uh, to the final point, and the Senate refused to stand up to this responsibility. Uh, it's time we do. We have the resources. Uh, we know how disruptive the pandemic has been, particularly for our youngest learners who need both the academic and the social experience of pre-kindergarten to be ready for that big kindergarten move. Uh, the need is there. The resources are there. The responsibility is there. It's well past time that we uh, step forward and take on the responsibility that we have. Chair Bernardi, thank you. Chair Pinto, thank you. I look forward to receiving the bill uh, in the K-12 committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Dabney. Um, Representative Katiza Wittoon, you're up next. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Chair Bernardi, for bringing this bill forward. Um, this is something that I'm I'm really passionate and supportive of, and and I would um, you know go out on a limb to say that this this bill doesn't go nearly far enough. Um, we love to talk about in this committee the differences in regulatory environments between state to state, and one of the favorite uh, examples is our neighbor across the Miss um, uh, not Mississippi, the uh, the Saint Croix. Um, Wisconsin, where I grew up, and um, and I want to take a minute, which I don't get to do very often, and just uh, give a shout out to Wisconsin from the rooftops, because Wisconsin not only provides 4,000 preschool slots for four-year-olds, they have four-year-old preschool written into their state's constitution. This happened in 1848. 95% of the state's eligible school districts offered 4K in 2015. But the most recent year that I have statistics from, but um, something something along the way, their their school districts can opt to offer a part time program versus a full time uh, day for four year olds. And I actually worked in one of those part time programs, so those those school districts receive about equal to half the support that they receive for older students. Um, and I think that. Um, it's important that we provide provide consistent funding for the 4,000 students um, and districts that qualify for this program. But I think it's uh, important that we consider and continue to have the conversation about providing four-year-old kindergarten for all the students in the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Katiza Wittu and uh, Representative Bennett, you're up next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just a question for the bill author um, or anyone else who'd like to chime in, but I'm just curious, so was, with K through 12, we don't fund um, a, a grade level, say first grade, we fund uh, by, by student. And um, we don't have guaranteed funding for a first grade classroom. Again, it's, it's by pupil count that the funding comes in. So why, why are we doing it differently 
for the um, the pre K. So I'm just curious about that. And uh, Representative Bernardi, um, call on you, and, and certainly if you want want to bring in uh, staff as well, whatever works. Representative Bernardi. Yeah, I I'd be happy to bring in staff, but I would also be happy to uh, collaborate and have this be a part <laughs> of our our uh, K-12 formula system so that all students can participate. So if you could call on staff, that would be excellent. And I think, and as I do, I think Representative Bennett, that, that the way that this works is, uh, is that each uh, young kid uh, is not actually worth a full student. They're worth 0.6. So the idea is that they actually, uh, I mean, at the very least should, should have that. But maybe we can have staff help first, just help provide the context for Representative Bennett's question Mr. and kind of understand how. Oh, please. Oh, there's a better. Can I just please, clear, yeah, could I clarify my question? So my yeah, question please. isn't, is, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, my question isn't so much, you know, why aren't we incorporating them in like uh, part of K-12? But my question is for the, the way we're funding this, the way we fund K-12, whether it's at a 0 0.5, 0 0.8, uh, 1.2 or whatever, the different weights, we are funding them by student. We are not guaranteeing them that they will get a, uh, enough funding for 25 students, let's say. Um, and so with pre-K, to me, it should be targeted funding per student um, instead of saying, we'll fund your classroom to this point. Did, does that make sense? I'm, I'm trying well, to get, get a handle on this. Yeah, and maybe I'll just, uh, Representative Bur uh, uh, Bennett, just to make sure I'm, I'm understanding. I mean, it, it's, um, you know, if if a student is in first grade, it's true it's not guaranteed a grade, but the student, the, the district gets money for that student being in first grade. And right now the student is in pre-K, the district doesn't get any money for the student being in pre-K. Um, so, and I I, uh, I see Chair da uh, Davney raised his hand and maybe since he understands the nuances of finance, Representative Ben, is that okay if we have uh, Chair, Chair uh, yeah. Davney take a cut? Okay, Chair Davney, please. Thank you, Chair Pinto and, and Representative Bennett. Um, I think the key distinction here is in K starting in kindergarten, we fund the need. In pre-kindergarten, we don't fund the need. So Mounds view, you know, Mr. Brown can speak, but they may have, I, I believe he said they get 100 seats. He can correct me if need be, but uh, they may get funding for 100 seats and have 125 families apply. If it's kindergarten, we fund those 125 families. It's only in pre-kindergarten that we don't that we refuse to fund the need so you know taking your your uh idea here we would simply expand the k-12 formula to include pre-k and certainly if if you wish to author the bill i would i would be glad to grant you a hearing but that's the difference we don't fund the need yeah thank you mr president yeah so i guess um i feel like if we went to the scholarship method of funding pre-k we would fund the need because if there were more students in a particular area, each would have that scholarship available. My, I guess my point here, let's put more money into scholarships so we can fund the need. And if there's, uh, you know, more, more students than there are slots, that would help open up those slots. But if we simply fund the program and, and in some areas, perhaps those slots don't fill up or they go to families who can afford to pay for their children, we really need to target on, on the need. And so I agree with you, Chair Davini, that targeting the need is, is critical, but I see that happening through uh, the, the scholarships versus just putting the money into the programs. I guess that's the point I'm making. I'm not advocating to create a new grade level by any means. I, I just feel like scholarships do fund the need. Let's put the, the funding into those targeted um, kids that really need it and not just fund the program. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Hey, Representative Bennett, I'm, I'm going to go back to Chair Davney. Sounds like he has something he wants to say in response to you, and we'll get, get let you go back again if you want to. But Chair Davney, you have something else on this? Thank you, thank you, Chair Pinto and Representative Bennett. Uh, we have a responsibility to make sure that need is able to be met, and where the scholarship structure fails is it doesn't assure families, particularly in Greater Minnesota, where the school district may be the only. Uh, pre-K provider in town. Many of our smaller communities rely on these VPK slots uh, to be able to provide, to meet the demand in their community. The scholarship programs don't do that. We don't say in first grade, well, good luck parents finding a first grade teacher. We say, here's your community school. Here's the funding for it. Hope your kid has a great experience. 
we should be saying the same thing at, at pre-kindergarten. Here's the structure we've provided for it, come on in. And that's the strength of the VPK program that uh, in contrast to the scholarships. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bennett. I suspect you may want to hop back <laughs> thank, in. Hop back thank in. you, Mr. Chair. Like yeah, take, we'll take one more, one more step, and then I'd like to move right. on to other aspects of VPK, but please. Thanks so much, and, and good conversation. Yeah. And Chair Dave, Dave yeah. me, I appreciate hearing your thoughts. Um, I just, you know, the, all the early childhood providers that we have around the state who aren't part of VPK, you know, the private ones and those that um, partner with the districts that sometimes and so on, they don't have a guaranteed um, funding either. They need to um, help draw kids to their programs and, and hopefully kids who have those scholarships could, could attend those programs. So, so again, I feel like the scholarship puts the power in the hands of the parents and the families to, um, to choose the program that best fits their need instead of simply saying, let's just fund this program and, and hope they'll all come to it. I, I guess it's a whole different philosophy and and uh, we could have a long, long discussion on this, Mr. Chair, but we won't now. But thank you for well, allowing that discussion. Appreciate it. No, thank you, Representative Bennett. And it certainly does does connect with the bill. I'll simply, I'll note before moving on to Representative Damoth, um, how good it is from my perspective that we are, in fact, acknowledging that there is a huge need to make sure that young kids are, are, are uh, ready for, for life. Um, and that uh, we have, uh, we need a, a big increase in funding uh, for approaches. There's some discussion today we're right now having about the precise way of doing that. Uh, but to my mind, that's the first step is to recognize there is in fact a big need. Um, Representative Damoth, you're up next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And to the bill's off author, just a qualifying or a, a confirming question for me to make sure I understand this. Um, so voluntary pre-K, the VPK, is there a means testing to identify need? As we're talking about the, um, the need and the number of slots and the number of availability, we know we need to serve kids. Um, my understanding is the School Readiness Plus does identify need and kind of prioritizes there, but does VPK do the same thing? Um, Chair Bernardi. I will need to call on staff to, um, to answer that question. And, and just as we do that, I just want to make sure to, that I'm clear on your question, Representative Damon, and for others as well, that that technically School Readiness Plus is the name of these continuing 4,000 seats that were that Chair Bernardi bills about, and Voluntary Pre-K is the name for the, the ongoing, I think it's 3,100 seats, um, and you're asking about the ongoing 3,100 seats, is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Chair, thank you. Okay, good. Thank, yeah, so let's have, first of all, Ms. Mock, just to answer the question if you can. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, Representative Damoth. Uh, uh, so the School Readiness Plus program, so the 4,000 4, 4, ongoing seats um, does require that a child meet certain at-risk factors in order to be eligible for the program. The VPK, the 3,160 seats, does not have that requirement written into statute. Uh, and uh, representative, actually, maybe just quickly, uh, Ms. Mock, uh, those VPK slots. My understanding, though, is that they are that they are aimed at schools that perhaps have a higher population of lower income children. Could you just expand on that a bit before I send it back to Representative Damon? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that's correct. Hi. So the way that the um, VPK funding is allocated is that it's um, funded among four different regions within the state. Uh, and then within those regions, the funding is prioritized for sites with uh, more kids who uh, qualify for free and reduced price lunch. Okay, so there is a, cer a certain amount of targeting of the VPK money to lower income kids. I hope, hopefully that was help uh, helpful, Representative Damoth, but sending it back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Mock, for the clarifying um, of, of that. I think as we're looking at this, when this is ongoing, even though we're targeting um, schools that may identify a little bit differently, I think we really need to make sure that we are targeting the kids that need most, um, that need the services most. Um, so if we are, um, you know, if it's a first come first serve or, or however we fill those slots in VPK, I think we really need to do a better job of specifically, specifically targeting kids that, um, that maybe do meet or identify in those certain risk factors to make sure that we're doing the best for individuals rather than just the program. That's all I have, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Representative Damoth. And I do wanna clarify though, your question was about the 3,100 ongoing seats. That's not actually what the bill's about. The bill is about the 4,000 seats that are expiring, which 
you know, that are means tested and are aimed at those vulnerable kids. I just want to make sure in case, um, and, and Representative Damoth or anybody else, please correct me. Yeah, Representative Damoth, I'll call on you. Just, I want to make sure, um, that's my understanding is we're not actually talking about the 3,100. We're talking about the 4,000 that are means tested. Yep, understand that, Mr. Chair. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions that the members have? Um, I don't see any other hands up. And so, um, Representative Bernardi will give you the final word as the bill author before we move to a vote. Well, I want to thank um, my testifiers today who came and the great job they do in educating our students and all of our members who are on this committee that are working hard for our youngest learners. And so, thank with that, I ask for your support to help um, our students and our schools be able to be planful and be able to uh, provide these opportunities to help our students ongoing and make this funding permanent. Thank you. Good. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Chair Bernardi. Thanks for your work. And with that, I'm Representative Pryor renews her motion to refer House File 2655 to the Committee on Education Finance. I'll ask the clerk to please take the roll. Uh, Representative Pinto, Chair. Uh, aye. <laughs> Pinto, aye. Representative Pryor, Vice Chair. Aye. Pryor, aye. Lead Franzen. No. Franzen, nay. Bennett. Bennett, no. Bennett, nay. Representative Bolden. Bolden, aye. Bolden, aye. Representative Daniels. Daniels, no. Daniels, nay. Representative Davney. Davney, votes aye. Davney, aye. Representative Damoth. Damoth, aye. Damoth, aye. Representative Jurgens. Jurgens, aye. Jurgens, aye. Representative Cotiza Watoon. Aye. Cotiza Watoon, aye. Representative Morrison. Morrison, aye. Morrison, aye. Representative Wazlowick. Wazlowick, aye. Wazlowick, aye. Representative Wolgamot. Wolgamot, aye. Wolgamot, aye. Vote results in 10 ayes and three nays. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, with that, the motion passes. The bill is on its way to education finance. Um, and, uh, and members, we're going to continue having discussions, I know, uh, about, uh, the, about different funding approaches and all. I really appreciate the discussion and the recognition that there is just a huge need uh, in getting kids off to a great start. And really appreciate your work, Chair Bernardi, as we send them up, up through educational finance to, to your work in higher ed and get, get our kids ready. So thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Pinto and members. Thank you. And thanks to your testifiers as well, uh, to all of them, uh, for your work for our young kids. Really appreciate it.